Uh, Professor Dan Bresnitz, distinguished guests, colleagues and students of SMU, ladies and gentlemen and friends of SMU, uh, welcome to this uh, presidential lecture. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Professor Dan Bresnitz to Singapore Management University for this presidential distinguished speaker series and it's, as was already said by the MC, the first lecture for 2012. This uh, presidential distinguished lecture series at SMU was launched by my predecessor in February 2005 with the aim of stimulating discussions among faculty, staff and students and friends of SMU, uh, in other words, the whole larger audience that uh, we have here in Singapore on issues of contemporary interest and significance. And we have been happy that we had internationally renowned and as respected academics, scholars and business leaders that have attained prominence in their respective fields that have been invited to share their refreshing insights and experience at this lecture series so as to grow and enrich the intellectual capacity and diversity of SMU through interactive discussions and discourse. Recent guests that have graced the Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series and shared their wisdom with our SMU community included Dr. Donald Stein, an eminent psycholo physiological psychologist, and Asa Ch Chandler, Professor in Emergency Medicine at Emory University, Professor Donald Emerson, Director of the Southeast Asia Forum in Shorenstein, Asia Pacific Center at Stanford University, and Dr. Laszlo Solyam, the former President of the Republic of Hungary. Tonight, we are most privileged to have Professor Bresnitz, who now joins this select group of outstanding speakers uh, as our uh, speaker, as I said, for tonight. Now, Professor Bresnitz has a very interesting career. He started as an entrepreneur in Israel and only later discovered that uh, above entrepreneuring, there's still something more interesting and it's doing research and being an academic. Um, so uh, uh, it's great to see that people out of practice can come back to university and enrich our ideas and our, uh, yeah, our research, probably with insights from practice, but also uh, with academic insights. And his first book, Innovation in the State, A Political Choice and Strategies for Growth in Israel, Taiwan, and Ireland, won the U.S. 2008 Don K. Price for Best Book on Science and Technology. And his second book, which is the reason that I invited him, co-authored with Michael Murphy, uh, currently an, uh, one of his PhD students at Georgia Tech, is Run of the Red Queen, uh, Government, Innovation, Globalization, and Economic Growth in China. And I assume you have the title here in be behind me. Um, this book was published by Yale University Press, and it was featured in The Economist, The New York Times, Science, among others. And I guess as some of you know, uh, I have spending my academic career over the last 20 years, 25 years, uh, on the topic of management of innovation. And I have to say, when I started reading the book, that I suddenly discovered that it was one of the best books, if not the best book, I had read the last 10 years about management in this part, of the management of innovation in this part of the world. So that was the reason why, after having finished the book and having still a lot of questions, I thought, hmm, maybe I better bring the man himself over to uh, Singapore to ensure that we can ask him the questions about innovation in China. Now, he's obviously not the only one that is talking about that. And recently, actually, a number of uh, more anecdotal evidence on innovations are coming out of China. And, not later than uh, in, the in the February issue of uh, McKinsey Quarterly, uh, we had a number of uh, cases, I should say, about what's happening in China and about innovation management in China. And many of these articles and these experiences beg the question whether innovation out of China will actually shape the whole innovation scene in the world and whether we will not talk anymore about Silicon Valley or other valleys in the world, but we will start talking about, uh, I guess, valleys in uh, China. Now, this, his book, Dan Bresnan's book, Run of the Red Queen, tackles the question on, of China's high technology skills and innovative prowess head-on. Uh, the study, which is a very in-depth uh, empirical study, offers a very close examination of the strengths and weaknesses of the Chinese economic system to discover where the country may be headed for in terms of innovation and what the Chinese experience reveals about emerging market economies. I'm not going to go in an overview of his book because then I would steal his thunder. And that's not the point, although academics like to do that usually. But, uh, um, but I, I don't want to do that here, but I do uh, one of the very 
important insight for myself uh, was how um, the whole innovation scene in China is uh, informed and, and, and triggered by what uh, Professor Bresnitz calls structural uncertainty, and which he will explain, no doubt, later in the speech. But it's interesting to see how different regions in China, whether it is uh, Shenzhen or Beijing or uh, Shanghai, have re reacted very differently, and that the ecosystems that have been developed in these different uh, provinces or parts of China, in response to this structured uncertainty, have led to very different solutions. And maybe, uh, without going to conclusions, but maybe it's precisely the heterogeneity of those reactions that lead to some of the strengths of what we see in China. On the other hand, the main thesis also laid down by Professor Bresnitz in his book is that the Chinese firms are on the cusp of the global technological frontier, but not yet pushing it. Uh, these companies can access the global economy and sustain competitive advantage, actually still without novel product technological innovation. And that's perhaps where the analogy with uh, the Red Queen in the title of the book is drawn from. Uh, as we know, the Red Queen is a fictional character in Lewis Carroll's book, Through the Looking Glass. And she made an observation to Alice, another character in that story, by saying, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Uh, and maybe therein lies the Red Queen principle, which states that for an evolutionary system, and I quote, for an evolutionary system, Continuing development is needed just in order to maintain its fitness relative to the systems it is co-evolving with. Now, I will leave immediately the stage to uh, Professor uh, Bresnitz, but I just want to remind you that I did invite him because I thought it was one of the best, if not the best, book written in the last 10 years on innovation in China. I hand over the stage to you then, uh, and I, uh, after your uh, speech, we will have time for an, uh, a Q&A session. So, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to put your hands together to welcome Dan Bresnitz here. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me here on Nod and all the people of uh, SMU. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, and I was hoping to uh, have this opportunity for a few months now since Nod and I have been uh, talking about it. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here, finally. Um, as Arnold said, uh, I will base my talk on this book, which I wrote with uh, Michael, who is now my PhD student. And just like me, he does everything backwards. He first writes a book with me, and then he decided that he wants to do a PhD. Um, but I hope that not all of you decided to follow the same path. Um, so let me briefly talk about what the book is about. So we started the book basically uh, trying to tackle two myths. And there's one myth that is about innovation and economic growth. And that myth basically states that the only way that states can have sustained economic growth is by mastering novel product innovation. So not innovation, but just the invention. Um, which we beg to argue is just not the case anymore. The second is a lot of the debates about China, which McKenzie and others, and they basically claim that either uh, they go to China and found those mythical creatures of true novel innovation, either in the patents data or somewhere else, and then they consider China to resemble Silicon Valley, and then they say that China will rule the seas and we are all doomed. Or we say that China does not innovate because it does not look like Silicon Valley, and therefore China is just going to collapse any moment now because it's not innovating. And I just say that I think this is a misplaced debate because it's fail to understand what innovation is all about and also fail to understand what is happening in China. Um, one of the reasons why those debates are wrong is because the world has changed. And uh, unfortunately, our theories and to a certain degree, I would say our policies have not yet. So one of the most interesting changes if we talk about globalization and our current globalization, 
is the changes that we have in the system of production. This is the first time in human history in which you have a division of labor where in order to have products or industries, you have fragmented production where locales, places, specialize not just in an industry, but in a specific slice of that industry. So if you think of a past and the rise of Japan, and you talk about the Japanese car industry, you really talked about the car industry, the companies with, and a set of companies that done in Japan everything. Uh, if you talk about Ford, which was the imminent mass production company, at the good old days, you have iron ores coming from Ford-owned mines on trains owned by Ford, uh, combined with rubber coming from rubber plantation owned by Ford, arriving to one location, and the other side you had a car. Now, if you talk even on uh, industry like semiconductors, which I looked upon, and you look at co uh, countries like Korea, the US, and Israel, all of them are extremely successful in semiconductors. But what they do within that industry is extremely different. And we have to understand what it means. Because if we take it seriously, it means that you have to have a very, very different set of institutions and innovation capacities in order to be successful in each different stage of those industries. Which means that we should expect countries to be innovative in very, very different and complementary ways. And once you accept that, the idea that everywhere should look like Silicon Valley or any other kind of model, or else fail, is wrong. Um, China's rapid rise is one of the biggest factors of this new globalization and the ability of, of companies to basically disaggregate their production and innovation all around the world. And as China, of course, grew, it also changed the world system. And that's what we call the run of a Red Queen. And Chinese companies are excelling, and they are working on the cusp of innovation, but they don't push that innovation. But what they allow and what they know how to do is to immediately play with those innovations. So be it uh, as producer of other people's product. So I don't know how many of you have read the New York Times article against Apple, basically claiming that Apple does not produce jobs in the US. But what was most interesting in this article is that Apple, as the story has gone, Steve Jobs, three months before the launch of the first iPhone, decided plastic screens are not good enough. He wants glass, a very different kind of glass, and he wants it now because in three months you have to have a phone. And then the story goes to China because Apple and Many of the other companies, like Cronin Glass, that create that glass are American, but they have no clue how to produce that phone and how to produce it in a way that it will work and be a successful product in less than three months. Um, and that's one way in which China innovates. It also innovates in a lot of the incremental, constant product innovation. Uh, apples, if you use the example of apples, most of its power supply is made by a company called Delta. Um, and if you remember, only a few years ago, Apple's laptops used to burn up in flames because of a problem with a power supply. Now you have power supply that every year and every product are constantly better and more reliable. Constant innovation. All of this innovation is happening in China. We also argue, as Arnold has said, but what is interesting about China is that you have very different regions, each of them successful in their own ways, and all of them are here. So from the point of view of a business logic, all of them seems to work in the same way. What is the business, the game plan of their companies? And it, where they innovate and how they innovate and what do they do is very, very different, uh, which means, I would argue, that China is much more resilient because together they constitute a portfolio of ways in which you can innovate. 
Um, and this model, because of fragmentation of production, is sustainable for at least the medium and long term run. So the puzzles is how did China create this model? Since if you listen to the central government, it's basically exactly the opposite of what the R&D policies were supposed to create. And also, how do you explain this huge internal variance and yet the adherence to the principle of a run of a Red Queen logic? And we argue that the main reasons of how to understand it, the main causes is we have to really understand the politics of Chinese reforms, specifically the center versus the regional tension and dynamism. And we also argued, as Arnold has said, that you have to put institutional analysis on its head. So usually, we, you want to understand how organization or individual work, and you look at an environment and you see what kind of incentives and capabilities its environment supplies it. In China, what is interesting is also what kind of uncertainties, and especially constant uncertainties, the environment has which move businesses to hedge against those uncertainties and develop a very different kind of strategy. So the method, since we are in the university, and I'll talk briefly about the method, but I promise not to talk too much. It's mainly a lot of field work and site visits, uh, 209 interviews, for example. Uh, industry focus on, is on ICT, well, mainly because if you're interested in economic growth, this is the Chinese high technology. 95%, slightly more, of all exports are for IT hardware alone. And two levels of analysis, looking at the central government, but also looking at three regions of Shenzhen, uh, or the Pearl River Delta, if you prefer, Shanghai, and Beijing. And that together constitute the majority of the Chinese IT industry. So a few statistics and graphs just to show that I know how to work an Excel sheet. Um, this is <laughs> the high-tech exports. So if you would look currently in the last year or two, the Chinese government tried to change this view of 95% by basically claiming that photoelectronics are not IT hardware, but are different. But if you combine all of them together, you realize that it's more than 95% is just IT hardware. Uh, it's huge. Uh, this is not a small number. It's in USD, the total uh, exports. Uh, just, it's phenomenal. I mean, I don't know how many of you look at the amount of, but this is just, for me, it's just wow. Um, and also its rate of growth, so of, which of course go down the, the, the bigger it gets. But if you look at here, it, this is the financial crisis, or how the Americans prefer now to call it the Great Recession. Um, it's basically a small bump in the road. Um, and, and this is one of part of our argument, R&D in China, and by the way, this is unique to China, unlike Taiwan, unlike South Korea, and unlike Japan in, in that stage of their industrialization is the huge investment by the central government, and this is just the central government, in R&D. And not only this is growing and growing extremely fast, but when you talk about the numbers of uh, 2011, uh, those are in absolute terms, not small numbers. So this is big and important for the Chinese central government. So, how from this you arrive to the model of the Red Queen run? Um, first of all, is the fact that you are, in the late 70s, a communist country which intend to stay communist, or at least being ruled by the Communist Party, and in the beginning really to stay communist, um, and you need to launch reforms. 
So the way you launch reforms, uh, Deng uh, once described it as grouping for stone to cross the river, is you basically what you say is you allow experimentation. You don't say, uh, in many of the cases, this is what the policy reforms are. But what you say is you are now allowed to do certain things which are extremely ambiguous. And on the provincial level, then you can experiment. Uh, and this is, by the way, continued to the 2000s, uh, when were the first attempt to create private enterprises there were especially, or not public or collective enterprises, they were specifically not defined and when various provincial government, as my colleague Adam and friend Adam Siegel described in his book, asked uh, the ministry, the central government, what, does, what do you mean by this new uh, kind of enterprises? The central government said, um, we don't know. And as a matter of fact, we are not going to tell you because if we're going to tell you, then we will not see the experiment. Um, once you do that, however, you also create a huge uncertainty about what are the reforms, how they're going to do, and you also create a lot of local experimentation in the places that decided to experiment. The organization of a national bureaucracy, and this is a uh, especially important to somebody coming from a Western or American tradition. Uh, you have different levels that are not necessarily superior or um, inferior. And you, of course, have two systems of control, the party and the official bureaucracy. Um, so a provincial government, for example, or a minister, um, it's not clear who and which one of them have more power, which create very interesting uh, variation of the story when you try to implement national policies. Um, it's also an extremely, and has been so because that's what Chairman Mao, Chairman Mao hated institutionalism, uh, personalized nature of power and influence. So when Deng, for example, did his famous Southern tour, which basically saved the reforms. Uh, his only official title was the title of a president of a bridge club of China, and it's not bridges in building bridges, it's the card game. And that was his only title. And you, of course, always have an ambiguous, ill-defined, and ever-changing nature of the reforms as China moved from more opening to less opening. And you never really knew what's going to happen in the future, which creates basically systemic uncertainty. Um, we also argue that what happens is, as those reform happens, you have a lot of experimentation and dynamism in the provincial or local level, but you still have the center controlling a lot of the things that we teach are really important for the management of innovation. For example, formal property rights, which is a big issue in a country that is still a communist country. Um, the national education and university system, especially the academies. And of course, access to finance and the formal research and development institutes are more and more controlled by the central government. While in the provinces, you allowed a lot of experimentation and interpretation of policies. Uh, basically, it, it's getting better now, but China was carved into competing regional economies. So I have a colleague called John Garver, uh, who, as he was traveling in China in the 80s, found out that it was much easier to buy imported television or the local television, but not television produced in the next door province because the barriers of trade between those provinces were higher than the barrier of trade between China and the rest of the world. Um, the second thing is that the time the reform began, the reform were not, provinces were not allowed to start reforming at the same time. You first have Guangdong, 
then you have others. And Qinghai, for example, was actually released from the plan only relatively lately in the game. And the third, and I'll talk very briefly about it, each region have a deep and very different history, which also allowed it to have very different capabilities and capacities on which they build the reform and move into IT. And each of those regional models, at the same time, is unique, but also relies on what other regions do. So for example, Beijing concentrate more on R&D, but partly it's concentrating more on R&D because it relies on production, even by its own companies, in other regions. Um, So let's talk very briefly about the region. So what do you see around you? And, and this is just a scale because it's important for others. And I'm a true believer in geography and not only because my wife is a geographer, but also because I truly believe it matters. What you see here is probably the world's greatest concentration of R&D in university powers. This is just the Haydn district. Uh, and you can see how many universities and research institutions you have. Um, Peking University and Tsinghua both are competing for the name of the best university in China. And uh, depending on the crowd which I talk to, I always claim it's one over the other to please the crowd. But I had uh, meetings with Peking University officials in actually buildings owned and restaurants owned by Tsinghua. And the other way because they're basically part of the same road. And this is, uh, of course, thanks to Soviet advisors who concentrated all those universities together. But what it allowed Beijing to have is unbelievable concentration of R&D power in great research universities, which have huge influence on what happened there. So, you have the strongest R&D infrastructure and resources in China. There's still emphasis on localization and second generation innovation in established niche. And I'll talk very briefly um, about those companies that you see below. You have foreign enterprise that really now open the major R&D centers in Beijing specifically to tap this R&D center. If it in the past it was for political favors, now it is because this is the place that you want to be in China if you want to innovate. Um, and you also have plans that try to basically de-industrialize Beijing, which we all heard about its pollution. And create more IT-enabled services and try at least some of our production to move away. And I say some of our production because, you know, this is going back and forth. Uh, and manufacturing activities are outsourced to other regions in China. So let me very briefly talk about some of the famous example of companies as a way to how Beijing works. So I don't know how many of you know IGO, but it's basically, I view it as the want to be Samsung of China. And just like Samsung, it created reliable electronics um, from cameras to other, uh, which never innovate the product, but very quickly come with products with features that they think fit the Chinese market, <coughs> cheaper products, um, and basically follow the business line that Samsung. Everybody here heard about Lenovo? which is also the, depends how you view it, either the Chinese Academy of Science Computer Center commercialization arms or the Chinese Academy of Sciences Computer Center is the R&D center of Lenovo. It's not clear which one is it in any day. And there's a company which I truly love, which is TechFaith. So TechFaith is very interesting because it's, I, I would call it the quintessential Beijing Startup. It started by a Motorola, two or three Motorola research uh, former employees, Chinese, that understood that in the mobile industry with fragmented production, if you know how to design, especially software design, a phone, you can have a business model because many companies now want 
a mobile phone that have a brand name, like Gucci. And Gucci will know how to create a phone that looks and feels like a Gucci phone. But they have no clue what a mo how to design a mobile phone. So Gucci phones are actually, and many of the others, famous brands, are actually tech faith phones, which are sold as a Gucci phone. Um, and Microsoft Research is just the most famous lab in China currently. So again, really looking at cheap, high-level R&D people, but utilizing them in a way that don't really push global innovation, but create unbelievable profits. And now to almost the opposite. So as you can see, this is huge. This is Shanghai. And what you have is a huge geographical dispersion. And indeed, uh, most of the uh, uh, real hardcore universities' main campuses uh, are now very, very far away from the urban core, which is exactly the opposite of Beijing. As a matter of fact, uh, with the unbelievable traffic jam, which is also called Shanghai, uh, it takes a day to visit from site to site. As a matter of fact, you can live in Beijing and take a plane and go visit one of those universities. You know, it's almost as easy as living in Shanghai and trying to drive between those universities, uh, which had a huge influence. The other is the heritage of, of large industrial conglomerates uh, and very strong central government involvement and support um, Shanghai, as I said, was very, only very late in the game, released from the plan because it was so important to the Chinese centrally planned economy. There's a great belief in Shanghai that large, the larger you are, the more beautiful you are, but a very flexible view of what is Chinese. So out of those three, uh, four companies that I have here, at least two started as completely foreign uh, or joint ventures and are now state-owned enterprises. Um, there is a huge tradition. So if you look at China and you care about the developmental states a la Korea or Japan, Shanghai believe in this model, targeting specific industries, even specific niches and trying to grow them together. Excellent capacity in capital-intensive high-tech industry, so for example, semiconductor fabrication, um, very strong universities. Unlike Beijing, where you have one central science park, which is run by one administrative unit, you have unbelievable amount of very different industrial parks, supposedly science parks, which compete constantly with each other which also means that you have very uh, bad dispersion. There's no concentration of industries everywhere, even when you decide to look for a niche like semiconductor industry, because each company moves to a different park, and the parks are all far away from each other. You really don't have a clustering of innovation. Um, and you really have a problem if you're a small company in uh, Shanghai. So if people heard about SMIC or Alcatel-Lucent, uh, the example is Medank, uh, which I especially am proud of because it's, of course, started by Georgia Tech uh, graduates that moved back to Shanghai. But very quickly, when they didn't want to have a joint uh, venture with the state-owned enterprises, found out that they have significant difficulties Difficulties that uh, reach to the level in which the founder does all the coding on the core product by herself because she fears uh, state back piracy, which I don't know if it's true or not, but that paranoia from the Chinese government by this business, which is quite successful, completely changed the way they even manage her R&D. Um, and then to what I call the wild, wild west of China, which is actually the wild, wild south, and that's the Pearl River Delta, 
And again, what you see here that this is even bigger, larger spaces and even less of a concentration of universities, which is not a surprise because the Pearl River Delta actually have no history of great and wonderful research universities. If Shanghai and Beijing have a long, over longest in China tradition of higher education and research, the Pearl River Delta has almost nothing. And however, it has a very interesting history. It was the first region to open up with virtually no R&D infrastructure. From day one, you had international orientation. Uh, extremely pragmatic um, definition of innovation. So if you go to Beijing or Shanghai, and you talk with public officials, and you ask them, so what do you think innovation is? You get a definition which is very, very, very similar to what you expect in Silicon Valley. You go to Dongguan or even Shenzhen, and actually every town we've visited in the Pearl River Delta, and what you have is an extremely pragmatic one. It depends what they had on their table. The first thing that they found, either an ashtray or a teacup, which is, by the way, two things you encounter if you have to do a lot of interviews in China, will immediately hold one, and you see, and they say, okay, you see this teacup? The first person to add this to the teacup was an innovator. And then everybody else added that to the teacup. So somebody made the teacup look like this. And that was innovation. And then everybody, and basically they say every innovation, which is the first to our region or the first to our companies that allow those companies to have higher profit, it's good enough as innovation for us which is almost the opposite of what you heard in Beijing. And you have the other interesting facet, and that is, since you have no universities, you still have very few, the companies themselves became the loci of innovation. Where R&D happened, where innovation happened, it was in the companies, and almost all of those companies was based on production and manufacturing. Um, you have both small specialized enterprise and collocation of complete supply chains. And by the way, uh, so a township will be specialized. I, I fall in love with a completely unglamorous industry called uninterrupted power supply, which actually is extremely important if you ever want to survive in a hospital. You never want that in the middle of your open heart surgery or open brain surgery, suddenly the power is off. Um, and that is in a township next to Dongguan, um, probably the highest concentration of UPS companies, including the whole supply chain network. So if you look for the Italian industrial district, it no longer exists in Italy, as we just learned, but it does exist in southern China. Uh, and this is part of the local companies and local official industrial uh, uh, strategy. And their manufacturing is the basis of their innovation uh, capabilities. And what you have, especially since many of those industries are not loved by the central government and are basically not allowed to even access formal financial institutions, you start to have all the things that we heard about in Europe in the Middle Ages or even later as it industrialized. You have trust-based revolving credit. You have a system in which you order from one another so you can open a new factory. Um, and this is also possible only when 95% of the whole industry is located in one small town. So if you misused the trust, you will be blacklisted effectively and wouldn't be able to operate in that industry. And innovation is also extremely close to market demand. Uh, and interestingly enough, and I'll show it in a minute, Shenzhen, if you look at uh, um, Guangdong province and you look at patents in China, 
This is actually the province that leads patenting in China, not Beijing and Shanghai. And interestingly enough, Tencent, which is China's, I would say, leading internet company, ZTE and Huawei, are all companies that started in Shenzhen, which is not only in the Pearl River Delta, but in the newest city in the Pearl River Delta. And East and Chesing are two of the most uh, impressive UPS companies. So East is actually a joint venture with Schneider. This is a completely local Chinese company, which is now extremely successful on global market with new innovation around UPS. Um, so here is, since I think I need to give you some time to ask me questions, I will soon finish. I just wanted to, to show you how um, I think misplaced is our understanding about where innovation happens in China. So um, this is Shenzhen versus Beijing and Shanghai, and Shenzhen really have zero universities. There's a virtual park of you know, campuses of other universities. But even that, and this is Guangdong, the province, and it's just, it's on par with Beijing and Shanghai. In order to save face for Beijing and Shanghai, I'll say it's on par with Beijing and Shanghai. Um, so the conclusion, I would say the conclusion is a current fetishism of novelty, to use uh, Karl Marx terms, um, is misplaced especially if your policy aim is economic growth and sustain economic growth. If your policy aim is to have the best gadget in the world, maybe then. But if your policy aim is to ensure growth, then our love of novelty might be slightly misplaced. The run of Red Queen explains both the huge variance and the same game plan and also show us that we need to start to change our perception of innovative regions in China and what do they do. Um, as I said, heterogeneity at the regional level equal resiliency in the national level, and that's simple portfolio you know, hedging strategy. And what allowed all of this to happen was not just the opening of China, but massive changes in the global production of goods and services that allowed China to rise in this way and basically reach this growth without the need for huge capital investment and also skills and capabilities that China did not have in the beginning. It also creates true interdependency. So as an economist, you claim that you have interdependency if you have a lot of trade, right? Because both sides will be poor if you'll stop the trade. But here, this is true interdependency. We won't have an iPhone without both China and the US and probably also Korea and a few other places. This is also true for many other products. Some of them are really important for national security. Um, it's one thing to think about interdependency when you say about trade and say, okay, I won't have Japanese cars. It's a completely different thing to think about interdependency, thinking without a country which might or might not be my friend, I won't be able to produce my products and services, which leads to the other problem where economics and politics leads in two different ways. From economics, we should all, you know, like Silicon Valley, reach our hands together, start to sing Kumbaya, and, you know, grow and be happy. From a political point of view, this is the recipe for horrible misunderstanding and escalation. Because if you're completely interdependent about someone, and they do something which might or might not, you don't do, risk you, you're talking about real risks. So the most rational things that you will do is to escalate back. And that, if there is something that uh, is, I have big concerns about, is because of that. Um, also because we have not been developed, so the, a way to solve this is to create system of governance that would allow us to 
talk more and resolve those issues of art escalation. And we don't have that globally. And I think we've just seen a few examples of those escalation between Japan and China and the Earth. And we will probably see more and more of that. Um, the last thing that I'll say, hopefully in order to provoke some questions, is that therefore the real risk to China long-term economic well-being is China. Partly because most Chinese leaders, especially in the central government, believe that novel product innovation is uh, the one and be all of economic growth. And they foist, or might foist it, on a system which is actually prime and optimized to do other things. So A, they might make this system less efficient. B, they might, and to a certain degree, if you look at technology standards, have already created mistrust between China and its trading partners and especially mistrust between Chinese companies and the multinational corporation, which in a world of fragmented production are critical for China. Um, and therefore, it's not anyone else but China, which might be its own worst friend and own worst enemy at the same time. And I'll stop here and let Arnaud take back the stage. <laughs>